Near the affluent neighborhoods of North Milwaukee sits an abandoned mall which so many who grew up in the area remember so fondly. But time hasn't been merciful for the shopping center since its closure in the early 2000s. In fact, most remember it now as an easy to get into, striking remnants of an era gone by. It's a building in shockingly bad condition, with a long series of legal issues which have tied up this massive structure in a web of limbo. What's up guys, my name is Jake, and in this 76th episode of Abandoned, let's find out why this once beloved mall declined so quickly and discover the notorious reputation it earned all leading to a pretty undignified end, which some within the city attributes its steep decline to YouTuber Casey Neistat of all people. This is the North Ridge Mall. Today's episode of Abandoned is sponsored by Babbel. Click the link in the description below to get 60% off your subscription today. It was all started by a local businessman named Herb Cole, one of the founding family members of the Cole's department store chain. Now, he would later go into politics later on, but in the early 70s, he wanted to build out a shopping district in Milwaukee. Putting up his own money along with established mall builder Taubman Centers, a site was selected at the corner of two major thoroughfares, with an affluent neighborhood of Bayside and River Hills just a short 10-minute drive away. On top of that, a planned freeway was going to further drive traffic to the area making this property the ideal future-proof location. In fact, this was one of two malls to be built in Milwaukee. Northridge ultimately opened in August of 1972, but just two years prior, the Southridge Mall had opened around 16 miles away in the south side of the city. Both malls had very similar layouts and nearly identical styling. They were also a package deal of sorts, often being advertised together as the premier shopping malls in the Brew City. Northridge opened opened with great fanfare, attracting tens of thousands of people each week, filled with major brand name stores and four primary anchors. At the time of opening, they were JCPenney, Sears, Gimbel's, and Boston Store. This was also all tied together with a four-screen movie theater. Across two levels and over 1.1 million square feet, the Northridge Mall was truly a classic American mall, one that helped define the era of mega indoor shopping. Of course, as a result, it was also one of the largest in Wisconsin. Over the following years, the mall did see some changes. The Gimbel's anchor store space had changed hands a few times following the retailer's acquisition, and in 1988, a new renovation would sweep the property, expanding the structure with a new food court, along with the addition of two more screens added at the Regal Movie Theater. In the same year, Herb and the Coles family had sold their stake in both North and South Ridge malls, worth around $220 million, or well over $550 million today. Those ownership stakes were sold to different companies, and the two malls were no longer owned by the same person, and as a result, became independent. This would now start a tumultuous future for one of the two sister malls. By 1991, Northridge was valued at around $107 million by the city. And it's easy to see why, as within, business was pretty good. Only a few empty storefronts dotted the less traveled corridors, and on most days, the mall was bustling. But then came a very publicized and heinous crime. On April 21st, 1992, Jesse Anderson and his wife Barbara Lynch went to a movie at Northridge and then went to dinner at the TGI Fridays across the road. Once finished and walking to their car, Jesse attacked his wife, fatally stabbing her. He then inflicted knife wounds on himself to make it look like he was attacked by a third party. Jesse falsely claimed that two African American men were the perpetrators. However, his ruse was quickly figured out and was sentenced to life in prison. He was actually murdered in prison along with Jeffrey Dahmer in 1994. This attack, along with rumors of a higher than average crime rate at the mall, had begun to deter people from shopping there. Ultimately, these rumors drove away the suburban white shoppers from the area and stores within felt that drop. By the mid-90s, around half the stores from the previous decade had vacated the property. In reality though, crime through the suburbs only grew slightly. But fear was widespread, and took on its own twisted version of reality. 
those suburban shoppers which fueled the mall's success decreased more and more as the years went on. Competition from other malls drew more people away, and fewer brand name stores remained inside Northridge. Really though, any new store was seen as a good thing, as vacancy rates had skyrocketed, thus perpetuating the poor reputation and that bad perception wheel kept turning. By 1999, the mall had lost its first anchor tenant. JCPenney soon followed after in 2000, and the long-term viability for the building was then seriously put into question. Following Christmas in late 2002, a number of stores had stated that they were set to close permanently, one of which was Sears, which was a huge blow. Inside, the mall was nothing less than an incredibly depressing reality. The escalators had long been deactivated, now with just a handful of stores inside the mall and one anchor, that being the Boston store. But it too would close after Christmas, and with it, the entire shopping mall. Northridge Mall had closed permanently in early 2003, but its owners, the Tucker Development Group, weren't planning on keeping it closed for long. Their plan was to redevelop the mall into what they called Granville Station, using a city grant of $4.4 million to turn the property around, returning it to a thriving shopping hub. Their plans for a 2004 opening never really materialized in the way they had hoped. Instead, the Sears section of the building was demolished, where a connecting big box store would then take its place. But that's as far as the project would go, and while they waited to figure out what to do next, the building sat vacant and effectively abandoned. And this is where the theft and vandalism began. In July 2005, somehow people managed to steal 35 commercial-sized air conditioner units from the roof of the mall. Meanwhile, Tucker Development put the vacant side of the property up for sale, around 46 acres worth. It was ultimately purchased by a Chinese company called the Toward Group for around $6 million. They unveiled their plan in 2009, and it was a bit weird. With the partnership of local businessmen, they wanted to build the Chinese Mall of North America, essentially reopening the existing mall as a cultural and commercial hotspot for Chinese businesses and products. However, with only that promise made, and months, and ultimately years passed with no real progress, it was assumed that the project was dead, and that was made concrete when the building went back up for sale in 2013. The forefront bidder was Penzi's Spices, at $800,000, with a plan to open a few stores at the mall, but use the majority of the space as commercial distribution. But a last minute bid from another company ultimately won the offer auction, and Northridge Mall was sold to essentially the same Chinese company, though it was through an offshoot corporation called U.S. Black Spruce Enterprise Group. It was now 2014, and their ownership style was much more hands-off. No development plan was announced after the sale, and while they were paying property taxes and performing some light repairs to the structure, their long-term approach would prove not exactly to be in the building's best interest. For instance, up until their sale, the caretaker for the mall was keeping the power and heat on inside the building to prevent pipes freezing and mold growing. That stopped once Black Spruce took over, and slowly over the next few years, the building began to deteriorate. But security Security was still on site, and the property was used for Casey Neistat's holiday movie in 2017. Their production was wrapped up rather quickly, and by 2018, security at the property began to dissipate. More and more people got into the building, and eventually a 24-hour guard had been removed from watching over the building altogether. By this point, the inside of the building was actually still pretty clean. A few broken windows here or there, and maybe a little bit of tagging, but really the million-square-foot abandoned mall was in remarkably good condition for how long it had been closed. But as I'm sure you've guessed, this wasn't going to last. By 2019, the condition of the building had declined severely. The city had already made a press conference essentially condemning the mall's current owner and unveiled potential reuses for the site themselves, even though they had no real development authority to do so at that point. This was all while the inside of the structure had seen more vandalism. The building was just so large that every time it was haphazardly secured, someone would just find another way to get inside. City officials and local residents were getting understandably aggravated by this, calling for action and stating this was a safety hazard. Indeed, in some ways it was. 
In July 2019, a maintenance worker employed by Black Spruce had been killed after trying to close a hatch to an exposed electrical box. This followed a press conference Milwaukee's mayor held in front of the building, stating his administration would condemn the structure and mandate a demolition order. Black Spruce responded a month later by filing an appeal and publicly unveiling their intentions for the property. Much like the original Chinese company back in 2009, this renovation of the property would see the transfer transformation into the Asian merchandise market, which is exactly what it sounds like, a shopping mall for Asian commerce. The concept art released looked like it had been thrown together rather quickly, especially the interior renderings, which I'm not even sure how the economics of that would have even worked, filling a rather niche roster of tenants inside a building which would need several millions of dollars just to get it back up to the dated state it was in. Not to mention all of the facade renovations, roof repairs, parking lot enhancements that would all be required here, all in an online shopping era. Just taking a look inside the building at this time showed how daunting of a task it would be, and of course that led people in the city to question their legitimacy. The building would only continue to get worse as nothing was done to follow through with their plans. With the interior in a shocking state of disrepair, and people likely entering the structure on a near daily basis, the vandalism had reached an apex. In July 2022, a fire had been started around the food court area. Then another, then another, and then another. Within a three-week span, four different fires had been started inside the massive building. Now, all of them were rather small, but the resources and lives put at risk angered pretty much everyone. Finally, the city of Milwaukee and their new mayor decided to give the owners an ultimatum. Either secure the structure within five days, or face a $2,000 a day fine and a court-ordered demolition. This was on August 15th, 2022, and those five days came and went, with no meaningful action taken. The building was still unsecure, and once the city confirmed this, they brought the matter to court, where the owner of Black Spruce was unable to attend. Apparently because she was camping somewhere in Canada. Right, well the executive did later appear in court. Is there currently security employed and working at the Northridge Mall as of today? Uh, not yet, but we'll very soon. Basically pleading ignorance and was present as the judge ordered the structure to be demolished. Would you believe though that Black Spruce filed an appeal for this? This was in November of 2022, and at this point they had racked up nearly $190,000 in fines. And through this appeal, the company stated they wanted the judge to basically absolve them of the payment and give them some time to try and sell them all, which they had already listed on the market. The judge ultimately denied the appeal and gave them one week to submit a demolition plan. But of course, Black Spruce had ignored these orders. Astonishingly, that brings us to now. Black Spruce has still neglected to secure the property and apparently called the bluff of the city on demolition. In their December court hearing, Milwaukee made it clear that they couldn't afford the demolition expenses, which could clear $15 million. Black Spruce has also made it pretty clear that they cannot be trusted with anything, and with yet another fire occurring in December 2022, the future of this shopping mall may drag on for much longer. But when you zoom out of this whole mess, it's just so stupid and, and kind of aggravating. Northridge was born from a dream a local businessman had, and was the hometown mall for many North Milwaukee residents. But its slow decline through the 90s came from a negative perception of crime that wasn't even based in reality. Well before the dawn of online shopping, the mall was already in a critical state. With the future highway to drive more traffic never built, and an economic recession in the early 2000s, once the big tenants left, it closed unceremoniously forever. Its subsequent development plans were carried out with little long-term vision, rebranding a quarter of the site with the Granville Station name and developing a small section of the property, then splitting it off and selling it to perhaps the worst landlords imaginable. From thousands of miles away, they spun the city around in circles, promising a development that had little basis in reality, especially as they inflicted self-imposed damage to the structure by letting anyone get inside of it and made it to where it was economically unfeasible. 
As for the city, I think it's silly to blame the condition of the structure on Casey Neistat, and the whole tone around it is annoyingly cynical, with many journalists using the term YouTuber as basically a slur. Look at any other mall which had a little online video documentation, like Rolling Acres or Randall Park Mall. They got to a similar, if not worse, level of destruction without a large YouTuber showing off the building. It's like saying because of evolution or Gone Girl being filmed inside the Hawthorne Mall, millennials had trashed it. No, they trashed it because it exists and they were able to. The blame goes to Black Spruce, who have allowed literally anyone off the street to enter the building and showed zero care for what would happen to it. Really, no one who's owned the building since the Coles had cared about the long-term future. So of course that would be the end result we have now, and that result is pretty shocking. From around 2019 to now, the inside of the mall has been absolutely trashed. The visuals of the property from just a few years prior to now is pretty stark. Though the mall has been archived forever online, with some really great footage from TMJ4 News and more recent abandoned documentation from the proper people. It's really fascinating footage and those links will be in the description below. The future of the shopping mall is now in the air though, and while the story does have a rather open end to it, the most likely outcome is that someone is going to have to flip the bill and raise the structure. But when that happens, in some way at least, you'll still be able to visit Northridge Mall. Or more specifically, you can visit the Southridge Mall. Yeah, through this whole time, Southridge remained open and even to this day is still doing quite well. It has been renovated since and as a result looks very different, but at its core or the layout and structure is a near sibling of Northridge. So one day, when the building is finally demolished, this will be the last physical remnants of Milwaukee's shopping past. Now, as you may know, I like to travel a lot and do new things, and one of my favorite cities on the planet is Montreal. It's of course located in the predominantly French-speaking province of Quebec. And as someone who is very uncultured when it comes to speaking French, I've always felt a bit out of place when I'm there. Personally, I've always thought it would be cool to be able to speak a different language, but never knew where to start. Thankfully, Babbel has solved that problem for me. Babbel is one of the premier language learning apps, with lessons designed by actual, real language teachers. I've genuinely found their lessons very easy to comprehend and actually quite addictive. Looking forward to my self-set daily lessons. Over time, I can totally see myself picking up French in a meaningful way, and ready to not be shunned while in Montreal. Not only that, but I'm also traveling to Italy this year with my mom, and she's now very enthusiastic learning Italian on Babbel. She got 60% off her subscription, and if you want to do the same, click my special link in the description below. That way you'll support the channel and you'll get 60% off your own Babbel subscription. Plus, and I think this is really important, if it's not working out for you, there's always a 20-day money-back guarantee. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.